Okay, so our next speaker this morning is Daniel Gonzalez from the Universidad Federal de Santa Catarina, and he will talk us about subset algebras. Thank you, Francis. Uh, so first, I'd like to thank the organizers, Lisa and David, for the invitation. It's been a while that I didn't participate in a meeting in person. This is, has been a very pleasant week, very fruitful. So uh, thank you very much again for, for the invitation. So uh, I'll be talking with, about joint work with uh, Juliano Boava, Julius de Castro, and Danny Van Wyck on subshift algebras. And the idea here is to try to uh, extend the celebrated interaction of uh, sister algebras and also uh, purely algebra, pure algebras and dynamic systems uh, to not just like the uh, conscrigar algebras, but also for any subshift. So just to, since we didn't see much dynamics this week, uh, I'll just do a small motivation. Uh, let's see to stop this here. Okay, so let's say you have a map from the square to itself, and I want to code it. So I divide the square in four smaller squares. And so if I have this map, let's say T, uh, that goes from the square, so I'm just going to call X to X. And in dynamical systems, you are interested in the orbit of the map point. So you will you've got a point and you interact this point. So let's say, right, so I play here. So the point's there, then, well, keeps on, go to one, go to four. So this, when it goes to this orbit, I can um, code this by doing what? Let's say that point there, so it's a, at a four. Then if I keep playing here, this will go next to a three, a one, three, a one. Uh, so this was what? I said four was related to, was where my point X was. Three was where T of X landed. One is where T square of X landed and so on, right? So I can keep doing this, this little game here. And I got a, a one again here. So this was where T cubed of X was, okay? So this gives me an infinite sequence of symbols that's coding my, um, that's coding this, this map. Now, if I wanna study here uh, that I'm consistent T, I wanna apply the map, this map T, and instead of st starting on X, I'll start with T of X, right? So that's what the map does. And then I have T square of X, T cube of X, and so on, right? So up here, the coding, now T of X was starting at three, so I have three, one, one. So upstairs, what I got here was a map that uh, just erased the first entry, which is the shift map. We call the shift map. So you just have sequences here in four symbols, and you just erase the first entry. That's the shift map, and that's what symbolic dynamics is uh, mostly about, the study of this uh, shift spaces. And also we, well, okay, so we look at the finite alphabet, discrete topology, product uh, space, and uh, we looked at closed invariant subspaces by this shift map. So, what I'm interested is um, in the case where, well, I could have done a, a infinite partition of the square and I'll have like an infinite uh, alphabet, say the naturals. So the thing is, once we do the uh, infinite alphabet here, if you just, instead of having just a finite set of, to start with a finite alphabet, I start with an infinite one and I do the usual thing, which is just put the discrete topology and take the product space. This space now is not compact. It's not even locally compact. Um, well, people in symbolic dynamics usually they say, okay, that's not a problem. So it's a polished space and it works with that polished space. But then for us, uh, is this space that you get is not really connected, at least I don't, I don't know anyway, with a known sister algebra that we study. So we'd like to try to get something that's, um, connected with sister algebra and purely algebraic theory. So uh, the first thing that I recall that I found mentioning this is uh, when Marcelo and Rui defined the uh, conscrigar algebras of infinite matrices, I think at the end of the introduction, they mentioned that 
that the spectrum of a certain commutative subalgebra can be seen as a, a good analog for an infinite Markov shift. Then later, uh, Ostofer and Willis, they did a very nice monograph where they uh, introduced some subshifts associated with infinite alphabets and for any subshift. And there they connected to graph star algebras in the sense that in the end of their paper, they show that if you have two graphs and you look at the infinite paths of those graphs, this shift, if these shifts are conjugate, then the algebras are, the sister, the graph sister algebras are isomorphic. So um, that's what we had. And then we wanted to look at something that would put all these definitions in this, just under one umbrella and do the work, right, just for that one from Willis subshifts, which are general, and also for ultra graphs or for graphs and, and so on. Okay. So what's the Tom from Willis subshift? So we start with an infinite alphabet. We can just take the naturals if you, if you want. And okay, so this is for the discrete topology is not compact. So we just compactify, one point compactification. And now I have a sequence, I have a space now that uh, this space is compact. If I take the product of it, it's a compact space. But in this space would appear some uh, sequences which would contain this symbol at infinity, which we really don't want that, right? So what they do here, uh, we put a equivalence relation, which just, if I have, well, I can just define a map here, I have a sequence, x1, x2, infinity, x3, oh, sorry, infinity, x4, infinity. So I just put a map here that I project, uh, I look at the first infinity symbol that appears and just raise the rest. So this will just go to x1, x2. Okay. And if there's no infinity, then I'll just take it to the infinite sequence. Now we don't do anything. Uh, so this induces an equivalence relation, where really you're just shopping out at the first infinite symbol that you, that you see. So the quotient topology here gives you a nice, a nice compact topology there, uh, which I will describe assume uh, in a different manner. So what you get really in their full shift is just all the possible infinite sequences with the initial symbols and the finite sequences of the initial symbols that you have. Okay. Uh, and then, okay, so we have this empty sequence that this would be the sequence of all infinities, right? That's, we just identify the empty sequence. Yeah, the, the people symbol. Well, I mean, what's the sister algebra that we have? That's the spectrum is that space. But that's yeah, that's the key thing that many people symbolic dynamics have studied that space. Uh, often, so um, okay, so as I said, we're usually interested in closed shift invariant subspace of the full shift which can in symbolic dynamics usually be described in terms of forbidden words. And here is also the case. So you can pick a, a collection of words that you don't like, right? So you forbid them to appear in your, in your space. So at first you just look at the infinite sequences, the usual symbolic dynamic construction. Just look at infinite sequences where none of those forbidden words appear on them. And then, well, now we're going to restrict which finite sequences are going to appear. And I'm going to look at the sequences that there are infinitely many ladders where I can extend this finite, finite sequence, that ladder, to an infinite sequence in my previous, in, in my initial uh, space there. Okay? There are infinitely many a, a which I can extend the XA to uh, an infinite sequence there. So, um, so then the auto offer really subshift is just, okay, the union of these two sets. And for the topology of it, uh, which I said, I was gonna say more. So if you want a neighborhood of um, infinite sequence, it's just the usual uh, cylinder set. You just prescribe some initial, uh, initial segment of it and look at all the sequence that agree in that initial segment. 
And if it's uh, a finite sequence, then you have to look at these generalized cylinder sets, which is, uh, for example, here, let's look at the, uh, this graph. This is actually a label graph. Uh, if you look at this symbol uh, one here, the first one, there's infinitely many ways to extend it to infinite sequences here. So that's a word that will appear in this subshift. And uh, if I wanna get a neighborhood of it, I can say, well, I can pick some, some edges that I don't like, departing from C here. I say three and eight, I don't like three and eight. So uh, a generalized cylinder set would be all, infinite se all sequences in the subshift that start with one and just followed by this, well, this infinite here represents infinite edges. So followed by this loop there, okay? So uh, the subshift here, right, is a label space. So all the infinite paths that I can follow in this graph. Uh, so we should be aware, right? So for example, uh, maybe I can go there. The finite word one, one here appears in an infinite sequence. I can do one, one, three, four, one, one, and so on. But even though one one is allowed, three copies of one is not allowed, right? So this is not like a one step shift, it's not a shift coming from a matrix. But it is a, a shift. Okay. Um, so, okay, so how are we going to define an algebra here, a sister algebra, to get this to relate to this auto from really subshift and to the known theory that, that we have? So, just reviewing here. So, if you have just a graph, uh, and you look at the usual edge shift space, that's just all the infinite, um, infinite paths in the graph. So uh, we can associate to it the graph sister algebra or the Leavitt path algebra. So the Leavitt path algebra is a dense subalgebra of the graph sister algebra. So it's a, for each vertex in the graph, I have a projection. For each edge, I have a partial isometry and the universal algebra generated by uh, these generators and relations. And just to set up notation here, I'm using the more usual notation in, for people in algebra, that they say that the projection at a vertex is the sum of the final projections of edges that go out from that uh, vertex, okay? So the sister algebra is the same relations, basically. So the Levitt path algebra is a dense subalgebra of the sister algebra. And we can see um, a graph sister algebra or a Levitt path algebra as a partial cross product or a partial skew ring. Uh, for cross product, uh, Nadia Larson and uh, Toki Carson had done it first. Uh, for the Levitt path algebra, Danilo Royer and I did it. So we start X is the shift space. Then we look at the group generated by the the edges, the free group on the edges. And the idea now for a partial action is that your group is not gonna act in the whole space, but in subsets of the space. So first, we're gonna look at elements of the free group of the form A, B minus one, where the range of A is equal to the range of B. So I have a path A and I have a path B. Uh, and here C. So I'm gonna look at the subsets where X of A, B minus one is just all the paths that start with A, okay? And so then I, I'll get a map here from X of A, B minus one to B, A minus one, which is basically, well, if the path starts with A, I can just erase this A and put the B in front and get big C, big Psi. Okay, and this can be extended then. Uh, for other, uh, sorry, well, this is, okay, this is here, sorry. For the other ones, you get uh, empty set. So this actually induces like an action on the continuous functions of X of A, B minus one. So, right, you get a, 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 now a partial action in the level of algebras. And the partial skew ring is the Levitt path algebra and the completion of this, the, the partial cross product is the sister algebra. Uh, just a reminder, right, that this is an hour, the multiplication here, this is just direct sum, right, of these continuous functions on these sets. And the multiplication is just, when you multiply two elements here in the fibers, you have to get the action going, but you're really a, using a partial action, so you need to, to take care of the fact that this is not always defined. 
Uh -huh. So, uh, right. So the Levitt path algebra is the skewing and the graph sister algebra is the partial cross product. Just a comment is that for the Levitt path algebra, we can also see it as a partial skew ring where we don't have any topology, just something, we just look at the space X that I have here, the, the set as a set, don't put it in topology and just look at this set DX, which is the span of these characteristic functions of the elements of the subsets of the partial action and union of these one V's, one V is just a characteristic function of the sets of all the paths that start with V. And then we get a partial action, you get this Q ring without any topology, okay? Uh, okay, so how can we do this for now uh, subshift algebras? So we start uh, with uh, alphabet, any alphabet, and have the shift map on it, right? So here's just some notation, A stars words, and this, the data that we're gonna start is just any shift invariant subset. So I just look at the infinite sequences there in the alphabet, and I have chosen an, a uh, shift invariant subset. That's my initial data. So, uh, okay, the language is all, the language of a subshift is just all the blocks that appear in some infinite sequence. So uh, the idea is here, look, when we were looking at the sister algebra, this sets here were very important. So, and they were like open, right? Because this is really, we're looking at those uh, X, A, B minus one was really just a cylinder set. So f for us now, uh, we have to be, be careful when you're dealing with uh, any subshift. If I have a alpha here and a beta here, and I know this would follow here by X psi, and I have say uh, a gamma here, and a beta here, and this will be followed by uh, XCI prime. Um, the fact that uh, a path starts with beta doesn't mean that I can put gamma on front, right? Before, I just would say, okay, look, X of alpha is there, right? X of A, B minus one, I just get every bar that starts with A, and I can erase this A and put this B in front. This is not the case here for this label graph. If I raise my, if I look here, something that starts with beta, it's not like that I can erase beta and put uh, alpha in front of something that started with, if the path was beta gamma prime, right? So we have to, be f to keep track of that. So that uh, motivates us to define this C of alpha beta. Um, which I feel like I, yeah, here, they should have been there, sorry. So these are the C alpha betas are really, is the cylinder set of beta, everything that starts with path beta, and that when I raise this beta in front, I can put the alpha in front. It's kind of a mix of follower set and cylinder set, right? So I really say, look, I'm here, right? I can erase this beta and I can put this alpha in front. Okay, so these elements here, uh, in general, they're not open if I, uh, in my in the space, uh, but they're gonna appear as projections in our algebra. So if they're gonna appear as projections, we're gonna be summing this projection, we're gonna be multiplying these projections. And so we need to consider the Boolean algebra generated by all these sets, the C alpha beta, okay? So this Boolean algebra, so it's the collection of all finite unions, finite intersections and complements of sets of that form. And okay, there's a description for these elements. This is where really things get complicated. So everything we do, we try to do for the, to prove for elements of C alpha beta, and then we have to prove that it goes through, you know, the more general elements of the Boolean algebra. Okay, so now we can define the um, subshift algebra. So we start with subshift, and we, it's gonna be a universal sister algebra, or algebra, here algebra. Um, so there is a projection for each element of that Boolean algebra, those C alpha betas, and a partial isometry for each uh, letter of the alphabet. And the relations are, well, these are the usual uh, relations for projections, they behave nicely. 
that's the partial isometry one. And for the third one, if you just look at these maps that are saying here, if you look at this left side, when I do S beta star, it's really, I'm thinking of erasing beta from a path. If I'm looking at a represent, uh, already concrete representation of adding a path and erasing it. So if I apply psi here, S beta star will erase a path beta if it's possible. Then S alpha is gonna put in front alpha. Then I'm gonna erase this alpha. So I'm just checking if I can put alpha in front. And eventually I put, and finally I put beta in front again. So really it's just the projection of the C alpha beta. So this is just the relation we have. And um, okay, so this is just a comment. Here we get the cylinder sets, the projection of cylinder sets and the polar sets from that. Okay, so, uh, so there was the definition for the algebraic setting. As I said, we also have the sister algebra. And this is, the sister algebra is, um, can be seen as a generalization of Carlson's uh, algebra, right? When he defines for the finite alphabet. So it can be seen as a generalization to the infinite alphabet case of Carlson's algebra. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, here? Are we going to see that it's going to be a cross product? Yes. Uh, different from which cross product? You have this algebra, then you have the cross product. They're going to be the same. Right. Yes. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, eventually, they're going to be the same. Maybe it's not the same one I'm thinking, but. Um, Okay, so then we have to find the algebra. And so the key thing here is we wanted to connect this algebra with uh, the automorphism from Willis subshift. See, we already defined that, right? We thought not, they didn't really make this, so this connection. So we start now with uh, subshift. And if we look at the automorphism from Willis subshift. And so what we have is that the sub the span here, the spectrum of this algebra generated by the S alpha, S alpha star is the same as the atom for Willis subshift. So this commutative algebra here, sub algebra, is really the locally constant function of compact support and um, the atom for Willis subshift. Okay, so let's just uh, get a, a small idea of the proof. How do we do this? So, um, let me see if I can. So we have, that's our, our algebra. So uh, the span of this S alpha, S alpha star. And so then by a result by KMO, which was in 97th Canadian uh, Journal of Mathematics, he shows that any algebra that's uh, generated by a depotence, and commutative, commutative algebra generated by depotence is actually uh, the locally constant functions on the spectrum, uh, on the spectrum of the algebra. Okay, so this is just, um, the character space. Well, it's not exactly this is proof, but pretty much this. So um, all you have to do, since this algebra there, is to prove that uh, this A hat is really uh, isomorphic or homeomorphic to the Auton for Willis subshift. Uh, just a comment, right? There is uh, that algebra there has a unit because in the language of a shift we have the empty word. And the empty word by our definitions will be the unit. So that's a unit of algebra. So uh, to prove uh, what we need, right, is to prove that this A had the character space, the, homo the non-zero homomorphisms are is isomorphic to atom for Willis subshift. So to do that, we really need a little lemma, lemma which is, uh, okay, if I have, an element in the character space, um, and it's non-zero, some element, some generator there, the algebra is equal to one, then, uh, well, if it's one in S alpha, S alpha star, then it's gonna be zero in any other S beta, S beta star that has the same length 
such that beta has the same length as alpha. So uh, the P of S beta, S beta star is equal to zero for all beta different than alpha. It has the same length. And uh, if, moreover, right, uh, if I have that gamma is the initial segment of alpha, so if alpha is gamma alpha prime, then I have that phi of, um, I just write gamma like that, uh, S gamma, S gamma star is equal to one, okay? So that's, that's a little lemma there. And this just really uh, comes from the multiplicative uh, properties of phi. Uh, for example, uh, if phi of s alpha, well, we know if phi of s alpha s alpha star is equal to one, uh, then I can just compute here phi of s beta s beta star. Well, this is just really my phi of s alpha s alpha star, phi of s beta s beta star. Now this is multiplicative, this is one by hypothesis, right? This one here, it's one. So this is, um, just my phi of S alpha, S alpha star, S beta, S beta star. Right. So, uh, okay. And this, right, okay, so this is zero, right? If alpha is different than beta, then it is so this guy here in the middle, this guy here is equal to zero, right? Because uh, we have the beta is different than alpha and have the same length. So then I had a S alpha star is beta is zero. So then I have that this guy is zero. Right, so this is gonna be zero. All right. And analogous, you can, you can do something just with the multiplication uh, there too. So once you have this, you wanna define a map from uh, a map C from the character space into the octon for Willis subshift. So if I get now uh, a homomorphism, so, uh, oh, P in a hat. Uh, so the trick trick here is to define uh, N. So let N be the soup of all the natural numbers such that uh, you can find an element in the language uh, with length N and phi of uh, alpha, s alpha, s alpha star is equal to one. So just look at this set. Uh, look at the set and take the supremum. And okay, so now this set is now empty because uh, we have the, again, the empty word here that will guarantee me that this is well defined. Um, now, if, if n is less than infinity, then we just define our map there, the psi of phi is just equal to alpha, uh, where alpha is the unique, alpha is the unique, unique element, uh, element, element in the language, such that, right, uh, phi of s alpha, S alpha star is equal to one, right? There'll be only one, right? Because of this lemma that we proved there, there's only one. Uh, and if n is equal to infinity, then we can define the psi of phi to be y1, y2, y3. So it's an infinite sequence as well, uh, where uh, this y1 up to yj is the unique, unique element of the language. Element, oof. okay, no, this is the unique element uh, in the language, x, such that phi of s of y1 to yn, s to y1 to yn star 
is equal to one. Okay, so it's again using the lemma here, right? The second part of the lemma, you get this thing that this this thing grows into. It's well defined, right? Once you have uh, an n, if this is infinity, this supremum here, you get an n that defines one, the beginning of your infinite sequence, and the other ones always have to match because of this thing that we had there, this part here, the lemma, right? Okay. So, okay, so this is defined, then of course you have to show that this is a homeomorphism, have to show that these elements here are really in the octon for really subshift and so on, but that's, that's doable. So that's the, the idea. Okay, so then we get this homeomorphism, so that's nice. Now we have this subshift, this shift that was defined previously with all the connection to the sister algebra, and now we get a sister algebra and show that it's a spectrum of uh, this commutative subalgebra. Uh, but now there is another subalgebra commutative one inside um, there, which is the diagonal subalgebra, the one generated by the elements of the form S alpha P A S alpha star. And okay, you can do can you do the same thing? Well, then you get here uh, something a little bit more complicated. We're going to be using U filters, so we get U hat to represent the stone dual of this Boolean algebra U which is the algebra generated by the C alpha betas. And, okay, so this uh, algebra is also, um, the, this commutative algebra is homeomorphic to the con locally constant function of compact support on the stone dual of that algebra, okay? So this is the space, the big space, where if you wanna get the groupoid, you're gonna have to get the groupoid acting here, or in this U hat here. So, uh, all right, so now I'm just gonna do a quick break because uh, from, from the subshift part, because we, we proved this uh, homeomorphism for the algebraic context in one other case, the same thing works for sister algebras. And yes, we can just, okay, you can just closure and you're gonna get continuous functions. Okay, you can do the computations, keep doing each one by, by part and, and do some computation of the norm and prove that. And we decided to follow this little theory of course of algebras that uh, this was developed with uh, Axel Giordano and myself a while ago. So this is just two, two or three slides break from subshifts. So say you have a sister algebra and B is any uh, subalgebra, star subalgebra, not necessarily close. And so we say that B is a course of algebra, right? When every representation of it is continuous relative to the norm induced from A. So in B, we put the norm from A, and any representation here, it's, uh, it's continuous, okay? So a representation is just a multi multiplicative star-preserving linear map. And the idea is for this, we are defining this core subalgebra is to show that, okay, if I have two core subalgebras and they're dense inside the sister algebras, then we're gonna conclude that the sister algebras are isomorphic. So that's the that's idea. If you want to prove that, right, if you have an isomorphism of uh, dense subalgebras in a sister algebra, this does not imply that the sister algebras are isomorphic. And so we want to just kind of say, well, look, in this case, it is. So an example here is if you have a universal sister algebra generated by generators and relations, and um, you get B to be the free star algebra with the same generations and relations. Then this image of B inside of A is a core subalgebra. If you get G to be a groupoid, let's find the hypothesis there in Bruno's book, second countable, and well, I don't remember all of them, none of them actually. Uh, then the continuous function of compact supports a core subalgebra of C star of G. Yeah. Uh, for that for, for that case, right? For the previous right. for, for that case, right? Oh, any core? No, I don't think. I don't, I don't think so. No. Think so? Hmm. Oh, but not 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 every sister algebra. You say that any core algebra has to be a, a universal sister algebra. Maybe, okay, yeah. 
Nein. Auch hat sie meinen Geist dann. Dann mach ich. Sei jung. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So. Sure. Uh, okay. So if all right. So if the cores are isomorphic and densely, see densely inside us, the stars, the stars are isomorphic. Uh, what else do you have here? Okay. So you have a sister algebra and be a commutative star algebra generated by projections. Then that's a course of algebra. Uh, to prove this is well, we just get an element of B here. So this is a star algebra generated by projections. Okay, so you can get this and rewrite it as a sum of uh, mutually orthogonal projections. Uh, ben Stenberg likes to call this like the inclusion exclusion principle. But here uh, in this reference, Giuliano and uh, Gilles have done it very carefully. So once you have that X is this sum of uh, mutually orthogonal projections, the norm is just the supreme over the coefficients. And then if you have a representation, since it's multiplicative, the, the images are also a set of mutually orthogonal projections. And so the norm is also the same thing. It's, you have a contractive representation. So any commutative star algebra generated by projections is a core subalgebra. And as a consequence, you get that if you have X to be a stone space, then the continuous functions of compact support of X is actually a core subalgebra of C0 of X since it's, these are all generated by characteristic functions of compact open sets. And so what we had before, right, we had the isomorphism of these our core subalgebras here. Uh, this is, we found the closure here and the LC there. So now the result I just showed, now, right, gives us that this, this, this point of, of closure of this uh, algebra is continuous functions. And the other one is the continuous function of the stone dual of the Boolean algebra. Okay, so there is the part of uh, four subalgebras. Now going back to our, our subshift algebra. So it has a Z grading, which is very usual to the usual thing. It has a partial skew group ring description. So via set or topological partial action. Now here, if you just want to look at the set, the, the partial action, coming from sets, you're just gonna use the C alpha betas. If you want a topological partial action, then we have to look at um, the dual of the Boolean algebra. So you're gonna be looking at the ultra filters and open sets with that. And this, once you have that, you have the partial cross product description and the groupoid description. And this groupoid, uh, the transformation groupoid, which we show that's isomorphic to the Steinberg, uh, uh, sorry, so it's isomorphic to the Acno Renault uh, groupoid. It's a little bit of work, but uh, it can be done. And uh, well, I try to avoid using the, the ultra filters here. And oh, I also mentioned, right, that we wanted this to include uh, graphs and ultra graphs and so on. And so far, well, in general, graph algebras are not unital and have just talked about unital algebras. So there is also a non unital version of these algebras, where basically, when you when we build the Boolean algebra, we just take the unit out. And then we define the algebra exactly the same way. But since you're not allowing uh, the identity here, the, the empty word here, we just have to include the connect, uh, conditions four and five to guarantee like here the cylinder sets and the polar sets are in this algebra, uh, right? This, the projections associated with the cylinder sets and the polar sets are described here in these relations. So we have the no unital version. Uh, and then we can show that if you have a graph where with no sources, with no vertices, that's a source and an infinite meter, cannot be a source and infinite meter simultaneously, then it's a, a subshift algebra. And also for ultra graphs, there are every vertex is regular, then that's also can be seen as a subshift algebra. So this includes the X or Laka algebras, they're here. Uh, well, not, uh, I mean, we, we did for the purely algebraic setting, but this works as well for, for the ultra, for the sister algebraic setting. Um, and then our main theorem, right, that we wanted was to study conjugacy, conjugacy of this, describe conjugacy of this subshift in terms of the algebra. 
So we're able to show that if you have a congruency between two Austin for really subshifts, so this is just a map, that's a homeomorphism, and um, commutes with the shift, uh, then we have that this being a oh, commutes with the shift and it preserves length. So being a congruency is equivalent of the existence of a diagonal preserving isomorphism between the sub the between the subshift algebras, but not just any diagonal preserving isomorphism. It has to satisfy a few other conditions. Like this first one, this pi one here, this pi map is just a projection from the dual of the Boolean algebra into the Austin from really subshift. Okay, so what is nice is that we get this description here in terms of the Austin from really subshift, which is much simpler to explain than than the dual of the Boolean algebra. So, okay, so this pi it's a projection. This E M and so on. These are just like some some finite sums of projections. I don't want to go in much detail, but this is also equivalent to uh, to what would be a conjugacy between the dual of the Boolean algebra space, which is kind of a cover space. It's the language that Briggs and Carlson use. Um, so if you have here uh, if you have a conjugacy of this uh, cover spaces, let's say, and they also behave nicely with these projections onto the orthogonal for really subshift, uh, that's the same thing as this isomorphism of the sister of the algebras, which is also the sister algebras as we we've been doing recently. So this is also equivalent to an isomorphism of topological groupoids, of these groupoids that I didn't really show you guys, but then there's some conditions and also these aggregating conditions here. So, okay. Uh, these results can be seen in the finite alphabet case as algebraic versions of the results given by Briggs and Carlson recently, right? Where they show the conjugacy of subshifts, you, you have to extend it to a cover space. So now the cover space is not exactly our U hat. It's it, a priori is different. In the finite alphabet case, we believe we have, uh, well, Gilles thing believes he has a proof that they're the same. Uh, but that's the idea, right? You have a uh, conjugacy downstairs. You have to lift it to this conjugacy in this bigger space, right? So, but this is algebra can be also be seen as uh, algebraic versions. This is an extension to the infinite alphabet and also algebraic versions of the results of Briggs and Carlson. And so, as I said, we are working this paper just on just sister algebraic paper. It's pretty much done. Uh, so then we computed the K theory of for a few examples, including there is this example of a M plus one step shift Austin for a Willis shift that's not conjugate to an M step, which is something weird a little bit. But we computed this. Um, the K theory here, which is direct sum of Z for K zero and K one. And uh, well, that's mostly it. Uh, I think here there's many things that we've been doing. For example, uh, with Danilo being studying this um, left minimal ideals, the circle of the subshift algebra, which is important there in, in algebra, uh, right people in algebra are interested in this thing. So it's the sum of all the left minimal ideals. When you sum them all, you get actually an ideal. Uh, I think this connects to Haynes' uh, talk when he talked about primitive ideals. But then we are looking at known, we are looking here known necessarily closed ideals. For graph algebras, we know, for example, that uh, the circle of a graph algebra, of a Levit path algebra is contained in general in the Circle of the sister algebra, the graph sister algebra. And the same happens here, but we don't know what, for example, the circle of the sister algebra. So, and, and other things, right? There is, I think, what's interesting is that you have now this relation between dynamics and uh, sister algebras, and that allows us to explore, I think, many other, many other venues. So, okay, that's what I had.